Hola, everyone. Let's start healing. I'm Adrian Murchison, and welcome to episode 53 of the Let's Start Healing podcast. We have more in common than we think, and what we have in common can change the world. And thank the Lord, we are at the end of 2020 after being stretched and pulled and prodded and just called on in so many demanding ways collectively in this year, we are moving into 2021. I'm affirming that it is going to be a phenomenal year for all of us collectively on this planet. If you're new to Let's Start Healing, this is a podcast where I really love to talk to people about their spiritual journey and their relationship with God. And it doesn't matter what religious background a person is from, uh, what their religious faith is. As long as they walk in love, I want to talk to you and I am down for a great conversation. Today, my cousin Charles Gilbert is returning. He was on episode 47 in a segment of Ready and Real, where I was talking to black men navigating 2020. And Charles is back today to discuss his spiritual journey. And uh, it's so rich. Uh, He shares so much. And I really love talking to men who are so willing to be transparent. And that's what he does. He just shares uh, his life with us and uh, his ups and his downs and the experiences that he's learned from and his relationship with God and his discovery of God in new ways. It's just such a joy. Uh, Charles lives in Buffalo, New York, uh, which is my hometown. I now live in Atlanta, Georgia. And he is a podcaster. He produces several podcasts. One of them, Views from the Two, I was on recently. And in our conversation, he will share all about his podcast. And so you will know uh, where to go listen to him. But let's get to it. Let's meet him and let's start healing. I was always, I wasn't afraid to speak my truth. but there was a fear of the response that I would get. Right. Exactly. You know, exactly. And now I'm at the point where it's, I, I don't care. You know, I, it's my life. It's whatever I went through. Exactly. My life It's my journey. You know, it's, I'm, you know, that's beautiful. So it was just, it was just also, it was like I had said in the, first one it was ironic just how that day was for for us you know we recorded on a sunday date of chadwick's birthday it sure was then the week last week on tuesday marked my seven year anniversary that i gave my life to god Mm -hmm. you know and so it's just everything was just in that and every time this time of year comes around i always think back to that moment right would you share that about your your journey to being saved? Yeah, I didn't grow up in church for twenty something years. The only time I ever walked in the church was for a funeral. Mm-hmm. You know, so I knew about God. My mom didn't speak about it, but I knew about it. You know, I knew there would be days or like Saturdays when she's cleaning, there would be an occasional you know, gospel song being played, mm-hmm. but. I never really was tapped into it. Mm-hmm. Started dating this girl whose family was very religious, brought up in Christian culture, all that. She was like going to church and wanted me to go. And I was kind of like, it's not really my thing, not really big on it. But she would insist. And, insist and I was like well if we're going to make this relationship work it's all about compromise (laughs) I have to compromise with you so I'll go Mm -hmm. and I've been to three different churches the first church with her the first church I went to was a church that her and her friend was going to and she was 
taking me there. And it was kind of funny because one of the, now he's one of the pastors of the church. I actually went to school with him. Mm -hmm. Mother who attends the church used to teach me and my brother back when we were in school. So to see that, it was kind of, I was like, okay, well, I'm familiar with certain people here. Mm -hmm. You know, I can be comfortable here. So that I would say that was my introduction to church. Then we went to her mother's church. A small church was very like the mood was kind of different. I don't know. I, I just it didn't <laughs> well with me. Yeah. You know? And then that's when I was first introduced to the Holy Ghost Spirit. You know, I didn't see it at the other church. Didn't know nothing about it. Never heard anybody speak in tongues before. Were you introduced to it as far as witnessing it or experiencing it? Witnessing it. Mm -hmm. So I witnessed it for the first time. And I remember as clear as day, I'm standing there. My girlfriend at the time is in the middle between me and her mother. Her mother catches the Holy Ghost. I thought I was witnessing the exorcism. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. she started you know jumping around screaming head shaking speaking in a language that i've only seen in movies where this is happening right i'm like freaking out but i noticed that not everybody else is everybody's just remaining calm and other people are doing it as well some is more aggressive others is more like it's this cry out for like help or whatever and she's standing right next to me and she taps me on my hand and says it's okay like she's fine and I'm like okay so we leave I'm driving them back her mom is like she doesn't apologize for it she's like hey like I know this is something that you're not used to you right know? It's this is what happens, you know, when the spirit of the Lord comes into me, I, I can't help what I can't help what happens. Mm -hmm. And then they said her mother has said, I think you would be more comfortable going to Zion Dominion. OK. And so we went. And when I got there, it was like I said, it's one of the biggest churches in, in the city. Mm hmm. And I got there and I'm seeing just so many people and I'm seeing love. Like I'm the love is there. And then the same thing happened. The spirit came around and it just hit everybody. I'm mm -hmm. seeing people running around in this church. I'm seeing people with because their colors are it's it's royal, it's royalty, so it's purple. So I'm mm -hmm. seeing with the like they have flags and they're waving it around and people are having instruments and banging on like the, the mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And I'm seeing this in different from when I was at the second one, this one, I didn't feel like when am I witnessing? It was like, I felt at home. Yeah. And we end up just going there all the time now. Mm -hmm. And the day that I got saved, me and her got into a fight that night prior to. We got into an argument. We were supposed to go to church. She ended up saying she wasn't going. I ended up going. I went. The word spoke to me because it was basically speaking on how, you know, beggars, you know, beggars need that love too. You know, you can't look past the beggar and just because he's a beggar, you never like look at that because everybody has dirty laundry. And it spoke to me and it was like, I don't know how I'm feeling. And then he was like, you know, if there's anybody that wants to come up to give their life to the Lord, come forward. And I was the only one that did, which for me felt more personal for me and my bond or if you want to say yeah. the relationship I have with my bishop, because I told him, I said, I was the only one that came up and he said, I remember. And I said, and it felt like it was you because the way it was even set up is, he was standing in the middle of the altar and the light was beaming at him. But the light seemed like it was a little bit brighter than yeah. normal. 
So mm-hmm. it felt like God was watching this happen. I told her about it. I told her parents about it. Her parents are very, like, I still communicate with them from time to time. And I kind of look at them as like a spiritual advisor for me. Mm-hmm. And her father told her, like, now that he's done this, now the real challenge is here. The right. real war, if you want to say, is now mm-hmm. about to happen. And the like, I can say the rest is history, but I know <laughs> people be like, well, what are you referring to? I can say that if I can paint the picture of what the devil or the demons that he sends out looks mm-hmm. like, Mm-hmm. I can write. I can paint that for you, mm-hmm. you know. And it was a lot of battles that I went through, and I'm still going through them, you know. But I, as far as those dark moments, yeah, I don't have them as much as I did that day that I had that encounter. One of the dark moments was when you were working at Sears. Yes. And what happened? That was the day that I seen a representation of the devil or a demon in the flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, me and her got into a, we were getting into an argument days prior, the day prior to, and my close friend Saad had chimed in. Mm-hmm. And him chiming in, he went on the social media and made a stat, and she knew it was pertaining to her. So oh. they went back and forth. Mm-hmm. Mom jumped into the conversation. Your mom? Yes. Uh-huh. The guy that she was dealing with, other than myself, so her side person, jumped in the conversation. I didn't because I'm not going to engage in this on here right too many things happen at the the expense of social media drama Mm -hmm. and this could have gotten real ugly if i had jumped involved into it right so it was a it was a truck day at my job and it's me and one of my employees because i was the manager at the time and I'm in the tail end of the truck. Like I'm inside the truck and I had a breakdown. Like I got emotional. I broke down and cried in the truck. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about everything that's going on. Yeah. Just that, that whole situation and just how like my mother's telling her, like, you're not the same girl that you, you know, that I know this is not the same one. Mm -hmm. Her just response to like everybody that has something to say. And I remember after the truck was done, everything, and that we're everybody's working. I come out, I'm standing like in like the middle of the warehouse, and my friend Alan is standing next to me, and then a mutual, a former friend of ours is standing in front of me, and all the back, like all the noise, kind of went away. Like when you watch a movie and then like the sound and everything just yeah. fades away, but it's like you just have tunnel vision. And that's what happened. I had tunnel vision. I didn't hear nothing. I started to hear this former friend of mine's his voice. And he's saying he's hot. Like I feel heat coming from him. And then everything kind of just all the sound came crashing back. And then I stormed away and I went to the front of the of the building and at the front of the building that's where our that's where the receiving pickup area station is and Mm -hmm. that's where like my computer desk is and everything and I'm at the desk and I'm looking on the computer and right across is the security door for our security and the head of that, the manager of that department, the manager of the security, me and him did not get along. And when he opened the door, I turned and I looked. And when I looked at him, I seen him, like I seen glimpses of him, but it what it 
the whole face was more so of, like I said, of a demon or a devil or the devil. And basically saying, like, I got you. Like, this is right where you're going to break. Like, just one more, like, just one more step. And I lost it. I stormed out the, I stormed out the building. I went to, like, the corner of the building and I broke down. Mm-hmm. And I tell anytime me and Alan are together and we are with other people and we happen to have like any serious conversation. As I tell this story, I get emotional telling it because yeah. it solidified our friendship. It solidified the brotherhood that I tell him will always be there. Right. Because as I'm sitting there, eyes closed, crying, all types of things. He comes right there. He stands there. I open my eyes and he's right there. Not saying a word, just there. And I always say, like, I'm in debt to you for that because you didn't say not your presence alone just showed me you're there he stayed by your side right i got you and that's something that resonates with with me to this day Mm -hmm. sometimes you don't need that person to talk you just need that person to just let you know i'm here right and and that's what he did and I've always said that that's what brought me in because we was always close. We was always close friends, but this is really what brought it full circle for me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What happened at church? You, you had mentioned someone giving you $20. Yes. (laughs) This was another trial or another, um, test of god Mm -hmm. the service i get there and there's this elderly woman that's sitting behind me and i can just this is at zion yes okay and i can feel her presence like behind me normally like i'm sitting there because i have like i have a certain seat that i sit in Mm mm-hmm Everybody that when they see me, they know that's where he's going to (laughs) sit. Like, that's just it. We're so similar. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm sitting there and I just feel her presence and I can feel that she's moving around, dancing like the the spirit is there. Is this an older woman? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. And. At the end of the service, you know, as most traditional churches do, they do the offering. Mm -hmm. And my bishop likes to change it up from time to time. Sometimes he, you know, it's $30 offering, 20, or sometimes he can go bigger. Whatever you feel like you can give. Right. He always says, let it be a cheerful offering. Don't let it be a miserable or I just. That's a beautiful statement. You know, let it be a cheerful offering. Yes. Don't let it stress you out. Right. Right. Because his mind, his thing is if you trust in God, even if this is your last. Yeah. You're going to reap from it. You're Mm -hmm. going to get more than what. Exactly. Uh huh. And. During this time, he was telling others, if the person next to you does not have it, give it to them. But he was telling the people who don't have it to let somebody know I don't have it. Which is so hard. That is the hardest thing for me to do is ask for money. Mm -hmm. I didn't have it at the time. I didn't say nothing. But this woman felt it in her spirit Mm -hmm. okay felt it there said god told me 
to give you this 20. She put the 20 on my chest. Yeah. She hugged me and put the 20 on my chest and said, God told me, give this to you. You mm-hmm. have an anointing on your life. Mm-hmm. There's blessings that are going to come your way. Yeah. Take this up there. And I'm sitting there boohoo crying. <laughs> or <laughs> up there giving it. Yeah. And I remember I talked to, and I didn't say this last time, but I remember when I had my conversation with my bishop and I told him about this. Mm-hmm. And that following week, I had it, but the following week, he comes up to me and hands it to me, like hands this to me and says, and he just looks at me, he just nods his head, like he knew because of that story that I told him. Wait, I lost you. So she gave you the $20. She gave me the 21 week. Yes. And then- right. When I talked to my bishop later on about this situation. On another day? On another day. Yeah. He, the following Sunday, gave, like, gave me. Money. money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more so, like, as the. Affirmation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also, like, a sign of saying, like, I believe that this like it was kind of right he was affirming what she was saying yeah Mm -hmm. and that same day you know the same day that this woman gave me this 20 and everything the message was how if the enemy can't get you directly it will go after those that are close to you and when i got home that day and I talked to my mom about it and I cried to her because I'm like, it just, it's this feeling that I have that every time somebody that doesn't know me sees this anointing or sees this glow or sees something about me that they're like, you're it. Like, there's something about you that you're going to do something big. Mm hmm world you're going to leave your legacy right world Mm -hmm. and it it gets me it gets me because of everything that I've been through and the the doubt that I've had growing up you know the feeling like I wasn't ever really going to amount to that or be good enough to get to where I'm going right so when I hear like my mother or my brother or my friends say this one thing, but when I hear outsiders that have never <laughs> seen me a day in, my, day in their life say it to me, it's like, well, something There's is something other people see in you. Yeah. And I feel like because the enemy and the devil knows that that relationship is getting closer and it's not, there's nothing that's going to make me go back and say i don't trust you anymore yeah the enemy's like okay well i'm gonna try to do something that's gonna make you say it like yeah 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 and he tried to pretty much try to take my daughter (laughs) Mm. you know my daughter had an accident and she broke her arm Mm -hmm. on a four-wheeler and she flipped over the four-wheeler and the four-wheeler flipped over her And when I think about that or when I found out about it, I was enraged. But she was how old? She was 12 at the time. Uh Mm -hmm. And I have this relationship that when I get enraged or I get angry and I feel it, I feel a presence like kind of from the heavens come down. Yeah. And a hand touches my shoulder and pushes me down and says, relax. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Right. Like you don't need to, you don't need to go left Mm -hmm. because I'm here. Right. No weapon. (laughs) (laughs) There's no weapon of form 
mm-hmm. you know, and I I was just like, I give it to you. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I trust that you are going to see see me through these times. Right. That's the knowing that you have that hand mm-hmm. that you feel. That's that's a part of your knowing. Yeah. Wow. So, well, so uh, would you talk about um, your dad and just the effect that um, your father is living, right? Yes. And so can you talk about how that relationship has played a role on your spiritual path? Um, the relationship, there, there really is no relationship. You know, I've taken upon myself to not have that relationship because mm-hmm. I've been since I was 12 when he made the decision to walk. Um, it was always a battle with me. I always felt like that was that was one of the biggest I don't feel good enough. You know, I even remember like it that's what triggers when people leave my life. That's the trigger. That gets well, did, did- did excuse me did he um did your parents break up or he decided he wasn't going to be in your life anymore my mom kicked him out and he decided he wasn't going to be in your life anymore he I, I don't think that he felt like he could be involved without wanting to be back with my mother mm-hmm. like it was the whole like well if i can't be with her I'm not really going to be around and me and him never really had the close relationship like he did with my brother. So for the longest, I've always had this whatever mentality with him. And then it was going to church, talking to my girlfriend at the time and her telling me like, you know, you really need to, it's your father, you know. She and could tell that the problems you were having. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even, and this is a, like, we didn't, I, we didn't have this conversation, me and you, but we, another argument that me and her had, but in the middle of it, I literally stopped arguing and I stopped and I said, this is his sins. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I kept saying the sins of the father is passed on to the youngest. And I said, everything that my father has done is getting put on to me. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of the things that I'm doing is stuff that he's done. And the it, things that were not healthy for you. Right. Self-destructive things. Like just the flirtatious Okay. Fidelity, all this stuff, like mm-hmm. all that. I'm like, that's what he did. And I just ended up for whatever reason getting this trait from him. And it made me sit back and say, I need to that wasn't who you wanted to be. Right. And then on top of that, I'm like, I have a daughter. Mm-hmm. How would that look? <laughs> Like, how would I react if my daughter comes to me or I happen to walk in and my daughter is crying her eyes out because some guy did her wrong? As a mm-hmm. father, my instinct is going to kick in. Right. You know? And I would just want her to see a representation of, like, this is how a man's supposed to treat you. Mm-hmm. You know, through what you see, how I treat whoever I'm with. Right. And my 29th birthday, I went to his house. Like, day of my birthday, I went to his house. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, I forgive you. You know, he didn't know I was coming over. I literally, I just got done 
going to the mall on yeah. my birthday to like give me some stuff for my you know i was yeah. shopping all this and then something was just like go there and i drive there and i knock on the door he opened yeah. the door, surprised to see me there you know it's like oh my god like happy birthday and all this that stuff and i told him i said listen i forgive you yeah and you yeah. meant it right yeah yeah and- I was like, you know, no matter what situation is, no matter what happened, like, I forgive you. Mm-hmm. And I let it go. You know, I, I let the situation go. How did he respond? Oh, he, he cried, you know. Yeah. He, he mm-hmm. cried because it was like he, he realized, like, I've done, look at what I've done. Yeah. And then there was an incident where we had to have an intervention you Mm -hmm. know me my brother and my uncle my dad's father my dad's brother we had to have an intervention because of a uh issue that happened an intervention with him yes Uh uh-huh you know um i mean i'm very transparent i'm not afraid to say anything my dad my dad's an alcoholic Mm -hmm. you know and when I say that he's picked things over the family, he's he picked alcohol. Yeah. Over the family. Mm-hmm. And he got into some, he got into some trouble with his job. His, one of his workers who, one of his coworkers that used to live on the same, in the same neighborhood as us. And we are from that era where, you know, the, the <laughs> yeah raised us and yeah even the people that even when we're gone they still keep in contact with us right and she happened to contact me because i was the only connection that she had she didn't know my she didn't have my brother's information mm-hmm. so she we were friends on facebook she you know texted me and was like hey um something happened i, I think your dad might have had a stroke or heart attack and i'm at work and I read it and I looked at my supervisor and I was like, I got to go. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what's wrong? And I was like, my dad might have had a heart attack or a stroke. And they was like, wait, your dad? Like they were surprised that I was so quick to say, I got to go. Right. Because you don't hear me talk about my dad as much. You hear me talk about my mom. You hear me talk about my brother. You hear me talk about my uncle who I look at as my father, but my actual father, you don't. Hear <laughs> about it. Yeah. But then that goes to show like, no matter what happens, that's my dad. Mm-hmm. So I call my brother, we go there, we meet up there, we go there. And my mom's texting me and my brother. And she's like asking me because there's this, there's this like a third eye, a sixth cent that I have where I can look my father in his face he doesn't have to open his mouth mm-hmm. i can tell he's drunk like i can tell. right 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 and for some reason i i didn't i didn't see it you know i i didn't i was just you know i don't know what happened but my brother my brother's like we my brother's in there because it's only one at a time you can go back there so He's back there and I'm in the waiting room and then they come out and I'm like, so what happened? And my brother looks and my brother looked and he was like, he drunk. And I was like, I looked and I'm like, how did I not know this? And then during the intervention, which is very interesting because (laughs) the way it happened, like I said, my, my Bishop loved this man some of his like some of his words it resonates with me and he basically says sometimes god switches situations for the longest oh, uh-huh. for the longest my brother was the one that was strong and and held it down and i was the one that was crying out and begging and all types of things for my dad during this intervention it switched yeah And now my brother is the one that is feeling what I felt since I was 12, Mm -hmm. you know, and 
my brother, he gets up, he walks out. I also feel like the reason why, is because now my brother realizes what I've been going through. Mm-hmm. Like, my well, what's the age difference between you two? We're four years apart. Okay. So at the time, he just had his daughter. He just mm-hmm. had my niece. And I guess because he's now witnessing how my dad is not as active. He's not asking about them. He's not asking about, you know, his kid at the mm-hmm. time. He only had one, but he wasn't asking these questions. So now my brother's getting upset because my brother's like, you're not even checking on your grandkid. Yeah. This is something that I've gone through. Mm-hmm. You know, he will get mad because like my grandmother who was still living at the time was getting photos of my granddaughter and things like that. But that was stuff that my mom was sending. Mm-hmm. And my mom, you know, her school pictures, my mom would send it to my grandmother. And my dad would get upset because my dad's like, well, why am I not seeing it? And we, my mentality is you can call, <laughs> you can, I can, you can call me and say, Hey, I want to, I want to see my granddaughter and I, no problem. I will go, we'll come over there. Now my brother's feeling that because he got mad over the same situation mm-hmm. and them two are going like almost going at it. And my uncle had to come in between. Mm-hmm. And my brother left, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm yeah. Done. Like, I can't do this. And one of the things he said, he was like, look at your, look at your youngest. He's because I was crying. I mm-hmm. was. And when, before I left, I told him, I said, your sins got passed to me. And. I'm looking at this and I'm looking in his, in his house, in his apartment. And I'm like, you picked this mm. pointing at the bottom. I'm like, you picked this. Wow. Over. Yes. Over us. Yes. And, and I let it go. And I said, and, and I tell everybody this to this day, like I just had a conversation with somebody recently about it. And I said, he's his own man. I can't force this man right. to do anything that he doesn't want to do. Nope. You know, he was, nope. he got another incident. He wasn't feeling well. They didn't know what was going on. They wasn't sure what would happen because they said he wasn't feeling well. He was sick. He's ill. Like he's looking frail and all this other stuff. I go to the house. Mom's like, do you have to, you know, on your way there, do you have to just call 911 just in case to get the police there, just in case? I said, no, I, I got this. Mm-hmm. And he was he was just sick, you know, and then we went to the hospital and this is right at this is like a couple days after Kobe dies. Uh-huh. And, and we're sitting in the, the hospital, like we're sitting in the ER and me and my dad is a, I'm a splitting image of him. Mm hmm. And people can see it. Yeah. It's two strangers. Yeah. You know, like there's no conversation. There's nothing. It's just, we're just sitting there. Um, backtrack for a second. The the day that you thought he had a stroke uh, before you got there, what state was he in? Was he passed out or half? He was was asleep. He was asleep. You're talking to him. He can hear you. He was awake. No, when when it happened, Mm -hmm. like, he was rushed to the hospital. When we got there, when we got to the hospital, he was there. He was there. I beat up. He was there. But but prior to that, Uh somebody has seen him, like, appearing to be asleep. And then when they woke him up or when they, like, kind of shook him, he was slurring his words. So they, that's why they thought it was a a, stroke or or a heart attack. Yeah. Because of just how it was slurring and everything like that. No one thought like 
I see. So the intervention was after he got out the hospital or? Okay. Yeah, it was okay. after. Gotcha. Because, gotcha. because my brother called and my brother called my mom and my brother's yelling at the top of his lungs and completely upset. And then my uncle got involved and that's when we had it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't, if I met your dad, it was years and years and years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I shouldn't be speaking for him. <laughs> but I think just being, you know, having a sense of human beings and alcoholism, which is he's he's on I'm related to you through your mom. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, he's on the other side, but this side of the family has a lot of alcoholism in it in the past. Mm-hmm. And I'm only trying to say that. I imagine that your father feels a lot of regret and shame. And, you know, when it comes to you and your brother, but you've been more vocal, it sounds like, uh, where you're really touching on those those heart things and you look like him. And I imagine that he really has an understanding of what he, he's done. He does. But like I said, I don't I don't talk to him, you know. Right. The last time I spoke to him was when I took him to the hospital or a couple of days after that, when I just checked on him to see how he was doing. Like late January, early February. Yeah. Wow. But yeah. it's it's just because like the space that I'm in. Yeah. You know, it's positive. Yeah. The, and healthy. Yes. You know, I, I'm just in a better, I'm in a better space. And, and I just know that like me and my brother had a conversation and he had asked me, like, when's the last time you talked to him? I was like, I haven't, you know. And it's like my brother is trying to, you know, he was trying to be that person. But as I tell everybody, that day that I said, you've made, you've picked all this, that was it for me. I wiped my hands clean from this situation because it's like, you've made that decision. You've made that choice. You have to answer to one person when it's all said and done Mm -hmm. and he God is going to look at you and say you did all this that's a thousand percent true and what's also true when you said that what I thought about is we have to answer to ourselves too you know we have to look ourselves Mm -hmm. in the mirror some point or another we have to look and see the bed we made yep all of us and that can be hard it is (laughs) <laughs> it, definitely, it definitely is i mean there's been there was plenty of times when i had to do that same you know, here look <laughs> in the mirror and say what <laughs> like this is not this is right not me you know even mm-hmm. when, even when i was hitting those bumps in the road there was moments where i was i was acting out of character and i'm like this is not me and i feel like that's why i said like God have mercy on me mm-hmm. because the things that I was doing, it could have went really bad. You know, it, it could have, there was plenty right. of times where there was a situation and something could have happened. Right. And something could have went left and people could have got hurt or whatever. Yeah. And it didn't because I feel like God and I feel like I have a ton of angels that yeah. walk over me. Mm-hmm. I have people that pray for me that I know genuinely pray for me. Every time I see them, like they'll tell me like I'm praying for you. And it's not in a bad way. Like I used to think I was younger. I, was, I had to be like 12 or 13 and this woman, she was one of the ones in the village. And I'm walking with like my friends. And when I was younger, and even still to this day, I am around more females than males. And I'm walking with like my group of friends. And Miss Brooks, that's her name, Miss Brooks, she looked me dead in the face. And said, I've heard this expression before, but when you get told this directly, it hits different. Yeah. Like, Charles, 
you need Jesus. <laughs> and I literally, for like years after she said that, I felt like I'm going to hell. Like when she said that, my instinct was, oh my God, I'm going to hell. I don't know what I'm doing, but she's saying that I need Jesus and this is it. I'm, <laughs> I'm done. Mm -hmm. you know, there was two people in my neighborhood that was like the church people. Yeah. That was her. And that was this elderly man named Mr. Laster. Mm -hmm. Those two alone. If I went over to Mr. Laster's house, I knew there's a good chance that if his granddaughters wasn't home, <laughs> he caught me coming out of my right. Bed. He's going to pull me, sit me down and pull the Bible out and just start, mm -hmm. you know, because I've seen it done. Right. He never did it with me, but I've seen him do this with other people. Mm -hmm. And then Miss Brooks, she was, she'll, you know, be walking up and down the street. She'll come out. She'll have her Bible in her hand. And it was something. Mm -hmm. And when I, like I said, when I heard that, I was just like, oh, <laughs> you know, people say they um, need to have a, well, usually they're talking about with somebody else, but I feel like it's the same thing where they need to have a come to Jesus moment. Yes. That's what she was saying. Yes. Right. Right. And I was like, I didn't know what, cause I, I'm literally just looking at the scenario. I'm looking at the situation. I'm looking at the fact that I'm like the only male on this street that hangs out with all these girls. Uh -huh. and it's like, I don't know if she thought that I was. She didn't know you. She didn't no, know no, she you. Knew, she she knew. Know, no, but did she know you, Charles? You know what I mean? Like Charles, the person. Not really, because I mean, she's just, you've been in like on Northland and right. that whole community was so tight. Mm -hmm. like, Everybody knew everybody. Right. So she watched me grow up. Uh -huh. But I just feel like, I feel like maybe it was because of, like, I came off. Like I said, I am a splitting image of my dad. But even my mom says, I, like, my dad's a flirt and I'm the same way. So I don't know if it was the perception of what you've seen that. You know, I was like this little 12, 13 year old pimp. Like that's, that's not the oh, case. Man. <laughs> so have you told her that the effect that she had on you? for a No, I, I never did. Because <laughs> when I moved from Northland, um, I think a couple years later, she had passed away. Okay. You know, but it was always just this thing. And every time she seen me, she always had like this, like she was. I'm watching you. Like, yeah. I'm yeah. Making sure. And that's what I had to realize is that sometimes when I hear people say that, I know there's no malice behind it. It's not, right. I'm saying it out of ill because anybody that says that you need Jesus, I don't think is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a thing that's saying like, there's not coming from a negative place there. Right. right. Yeah. So, well, um, so talk about for me, uh, just self-esteem and you, you brought up growing up, um, where you had some insecurity growing, you were born with water on the brain, which mm -hmm. I'd like for you to describe that again, and just sort of, um, blossoming out of some of the insecurities that you had well, earlier in your life. Well, growing up, I had a condition that was water to the brain in which the doctor had pretty much told my mom that if I was to still be here, like if I was to, st if they went on with the procedure or whatever, I would have defects. Like I have mm -hmm. that, like I have a, I will be considered special, like mentally challenged mm -hmm. or whatever the if she went to full term yeah mm -hmm. um and 
their other option was just to get rid, you know, get rid of me in general. Like I wouldn't even be here right now. And my and mom, to make sure I understand, because I know I asked you guys <laughs> before, meaning they weren't they were saying she had the option of not going full term with mm-hmm. with you while she was pregnant, or she had an option after you were born. Yes, to go through a procedure that would um get the water out the brain and everything. So it it was just when when I was told about this and told that the doctors was insisting on getting like not going through with this and not having her go through it and me being gone. I was like, I felt like from that moment, it was like, I didn't feel like they felt like I was good enough. Right. And growing, going through the situation with my dad, it was, I, I wasn't good enough. My brother wasn't good enough for you to stay here. Like despite I, I get it. We having a child now, not in a relationship with the mother. I get it, but I'm still involved with my daughter's life, mm-hmm. like every day. Right. And I just looked at it like you couldn't do that. You know, then every relationship, whether it is with a female or friendship, you know, whatever the case is, if it goes astray it led me to think I wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't until I got into therapy, but more importantly, I, my relationship with God grew more for me to have the confidence in myself to know people come for a reason Mm-hmm. You know, um, some are for a season, some are blessings. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's how I look at it. I look at it as those that have left, left with me learning something to better myself. Mm-hmm. And I never question now why this person left. I used to question it. Mm-hmm. Now I don't. Because right. I know that. God is there's a reason why this chapter closed. Right. You know, and it taught me something. Mm-hmm. It showed me something. You know, I, I look at every lesson as a blessing. Even when I take a, a loss, I mm-hmm. look at it as it's it's a lesson. Right. It's a, something you know even I I try to even look at a law sometimes as it being a blessing Mm -hmm. you know because I I look at you know if there was a job that I wanted or there was something that I wanted that I did not get I think about and I'm like well there's a reason why I didn't get it maybe because there's something better exactly waiting for me exactly you know that's why I tell everybody all the time, like, don't rush. Mm -hmm. Do not rush at all. I tell, I just had this conversation with, um, Sean, Mm -hmm. my co-host. And I told him timing is everything to me. You know, when we started thinking about doing the podcast, him and Asai was ready to go. Like they were like to get this going. But I was the one that wasn't pulling. I wasn't making no move. I had to get put in a, God had to place me in the right place. Mm -hmm. He knew and he knows what the destiny is. Right. And he knows that in order for me to get to the the goal, to get to where I want to get to, I had to go through the school route. Mm -hmm. I had to learn the business from the inside and then be able to spread this knowledge to Mm -hmm. everyone. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to deal with P 
people. I was I'm taking, you know, when I was at my previous school, um, SUNY Erie, I was taking a human interaction class. Mm -hmm. I was taking interpersonal communication. I'm taking these so I can know how, like, I already know how to communicate with people, but now I have a better understanding of how communication actually works. I have a better understanding of how people work. Mm -hmm. I've just, I just had this conversation with Sean yesterday because there was some turmoil that was brewing within the, the team. And Sean said he would rather me talk to him when I'm angry rather than go talk to someone else. And I explained to him, I said, I've learned you cannot hold conversations with people when you're angry because you're emotional. Mm -hmm. I've learned this from this class, but I also learned it from trial. Right. Because I know my temper. And I said, and you know my temper, so you know how I can get and you know my 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 words cut. Like people say that, like, yeah, words cut. If words cut, my words is like a machete. Mm-hmm. And I'm it's like it's like a one little and your whole arm is like gushing out. Right. You know. And I'm like, I would rather talk to someone. I talk to a side. That's part of you processing. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I talk to a side. Mm-hmm. I have to talk to someone that I can get yeah. this out first. Mm-hmm. And then the bond with me and the side is we can talk to each other if we're venting or we have these moments, we could talk to each other and God has this relate. God has this interest, interesting relationship with me and him. So me and the side would talk side will start to do what I do. He starts to die. He starts to digest and, and take apart the whole situation. And then he just starts to like kind of reiterate what I was just saying, but mm-hmm. then, going in and questioning forms like yo so why did this happen and then i start to we start to bounce these ideas yeah and, and it's like a calming mm-hmm. and it's like okay i can talk to him mm-hmm. i have my relationship with god is is god tells me when it's time to talk to people yeah because i i, I don't want to say it's a gift of mine. I feel like God blessed me with this now where my spirit comes out of my body and there's a spirit that comes in and to whomever I'm talking to, this spirit is talking on behalf of God. Right. And I know when those times come, like I, God has this conversation with me and tells me like, get prepared, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of why at the end of the year, I go quiet, Mm -hmm. you know, for a moment, you know, I would get off of social media. I would deactivate all my accounts. If I'm doing the podcast, like, you know, we, we doing the podcast. I took a step back. Mm-hmm. I didn't record for almost two months. Right. You know, I had to do that because I had to see what was going on. God had to tell me to sit down. Mm-hmm. You're doing too much right now. Like you are, you're, you're doing too much. You got school going on. You're trying to push this podcast. You're, you're still working on your other podcast relax. Right. You know, because I'm the head of the table for this part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm not right, this ship is going to. Right. You have to be clear so you can receive what God has to tell you so you can hear. 
Yes. And so if you have a lot going on, it, that's true for all of us. If mm. we have a lot going on, we can't hear. We can't yeah. hear what, you know, where we're being led to. We can't hear his voice or guidance. Right. And and that's what happened. And with me doing and going back to the whole communication thing and, you know, me being able to learn these these tools. I learned that through interaction, you know, through my human interaction class, I learned if you don't do this, it's just going to explode. If you don't do what, if, if each individual person doesn't do what they need to do. Right. To process basically for lack of a better word. Yeah. My professor, um, he's a doctor now, Mm -hmm. but he, he used this analogy and I use it all the time now. I said, it's like taking out the trash. You know, if you see that the trash is full, but you don't take it out, but you keep just adding garbage onto it, adding garbage onto it, it's going to overflow. Mm-hmm. And then when it's, and when you're like, all right, let me take the garbage out. And when you go to lift it, everything from the bottom is just going to drop out. Right. That's what happens with people when they have too much going on or they keep their emotions bottled up. Oh, yeah. And it keeps piling and piling and piling. Eventually, it explodes. That's what happened to me when I was younger. You know, I was younger and I had this bad temper and it kept growing and growing. And then I lashed out. And the doctor said, if I punched the wall a little bit harder, I'd have shattered my whole entire hand. <laughs> hey, <laughs> my brother Jeff broke his hand, smashing it on the floor. He was sitting on the floor and was mad at his girlfriend, smashed <laughs> his hand on the floor and broke his hand. Had to have surgery. <laughs> on his I, hand. I, I didn't have to do any of that. They just gave me <laughs> cast. They was like, just keep this cast on. Uh huh. You know, but just I like that's that's another thing you know yeah looking back at all this stuff i'm like doctor said if i punch the wall a little bit harder he said it's just if you put a little bit more oomph into it you would have shot right. the man and i'm like something st- like something like god came in <laughs> it was like i'm just okay you want to get angry okay i'm gonna let you take you take your anger out you're gonna regret it <laughs> yeah yeah you know, but this is, it's, it's a lesson. Mm-hmm. Don't do this again, you know, and then just growing and then being in these positions and learning the stuff I'm learning. Like I said, God literally told me like, this is the moment. Mm-hmm. And when I hear him tell me, this is the moment, I'm not going to tell him no. Right. You know, because right. if, not now then right 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 you know right um so you are as you're talking i'm thinking about how you are intuitive which to me comes from god and that is leading me to wanting you to to talk about empathy and energy (laughs) which is what we talked about the other day (laughs) you're an empath I and you feel energy. Yes. Yes. I'm an empath. And I yes. just found out what that meant a couple weeks ago <laughs> to Alan. <laughs> because me and Alan is having a conversation and I'm bringing up a certain female and he goes, You're an empath. <laughs> what? And he, <laughs> he explains it to me and I said, Oh my God. Like, that's what that is. Yeah. I mean, it's, you have to really be careful being, I'm an empath, as I told Mm -hmm. you, you have to really be careful. And that's what I realized after he explained that to me. Yeah. I realized that. And then going through like my, my therapy sessions, like my therapist never used that term. And I'm actually going to tell her about that next time. How how would she characterize it? She was characterized as it's, it's in my nature. Uh-huh. my nature to to feel what other people are feeling and to you know try your hardest to fix right, the right. problem or whatever mm-hmm. and 
I was like, that's that's really what it is. And then I remember I like reading about like yeah tropes and things like that. And I remember I was reading something about a Taurus. Cause that's me and your we're we're both Taurus. Yes. And <laughs> they said something because I was reading this to a friend of mine who happened, you know, because there's this attraction and she's, you know, trying like not we're, you know, talking or whatever. Uh-huh. And I told her, because she, you know, she kept poking. And I told her, I read this to her. It's like God sent this to me. God said, here. What did it? What was it? It was like, I go on Pinterest from time to time. Uh-huh. Randomly to search stuff. Yeah. So I searched like Taurus. Like, on Pinterest. Okay. Yeah. And it stated like, when dealing with a Taurus, if a Taurus is quiet, it was like, if your Taurus is quiet, give them their space. Yeah. Because what they're doing is they are recharging. They're trying to yeah. recenter themselves because yeah. they've, they're, they've been drained. Yeah. They take on so much and mm-hmm. they're trying to do all this stuff. And get grounded. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, it was like, if you see them quiet, let them just don't bother them. Yeah. You know, if the Taurus really trust you, we will come back around. Right. But don't push the mm-hmm. needle. Like, don't push it. And Can you tell that to every man <laughs> from my past? <laughs> that's been a problem. <laughs> Go ahead. So, I uh, I was just, I was sitting there and that, that's just the thing. Like I'm big on energy, you know? Yeah. Funny story. I was given the name Chi by my brother when I was like 12 Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what it was. He's like, yo, Chi. And I was like, (laughs) Hey, like, all right. And then another friend just threw energy in there. And then later on, when I got like, when I was like, what does this mean? Cause I'm here, like, I hear it, but I hear it in within like the Asian culture, like, right. Enter your chi and all this. And I said, what? And I looked it up and yeah. it's, it's energy. Yes. And I've always been big on that, you yeah. know? And it's been a point where I used to have negative energy. And I had it when I was a kid and I was like, why? Like, I can't answer why I had negative energy when I was a kid. It might've been because of the trauma that I had of my dad leaving and Mm -hmm. I never expressed it or never had an outlet to get this anger or aggression out. But now like I look at it and if I walk into an environment and the mood to my, my whole energy just switches. Right. I'm like, I got to get out of here. Yeah. I, I yeah. have to get out because I don't want the energy to mess with me. Yes. You know, yeah. and then being a, being an empath, mm-hmm. if I, I can text somebody, somebody can text me. And I can read the text message and feel the energy and the energy will just like, yeah, me. And then I can be in the best of moods. And then that energy hit me. And I'm just like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I really don't know what happens. No, I'm sitting here trying to get myself out of whatever, mm-hmm. you know, it is and because of the person that I am like I the people that I care for I care for deeply right and I take heavy investment in those so if there is a point where I get you know really involved or invested in the situation that's because I really truly care for that situation I care for that person mm-hmm. and it takes a toll on me it takes a toll on you. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a way to share for a person to share their problems and not make 
Like there's a way for me to share my problems and not make my problem your problem. There's a way for people to do that. And I think people, a lot of people don't um, take responsibility in, in not making, not projecting their negative energy onto somebody else. Well, just like you said, I need to let those men know. Mm-hmm. You need to let these, <laughs> these <laughs> women that I have dealt with in the past <laughs> know because it... Uh, it it was very yeah you know but then i also look at it as i always was i've always been drawn to those that need help Mm -hmm. you know i've always felt like and that's why when we when you brought up the whole the little whisper in my ear of the the calling of ministering and all this that's the fear because i already have feel like i get drawn to people of trouble that are troubled Mm -hmm. now if i take this this whisper that's in my ear and really catapult it and really go to that level not only am i dealing with like i will be dealing with it heavier yeah than you know the next person yeah 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 how how i how I'm programmed. Yeah. I was telling you, I was thinking about therapists. Um, and I had a therapist some years ago and I was asking her about exactly what you're saying about just taking on energy. And she was telling me that she, she would put up, um, a protective veil basically, you know, sort of like a spiritual veil. She would say a prayer and put up a veil around her that would sort of be a shield from the energy penetrating and, you know, staying on her. Yeah. And so I do that. I try to say a prayer. I might not think of it in terms of a, of a, a veil, but I do think of it as a sense of protection. You know, I, 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 I have to start doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have to start doing that because I will walk into a situation, know the energy is wrong, go away from it, but then something will tell me to come back to figure yeah. what the problem is or something it's, energy is real it is that's real and i think more people understand that now not maybe not to the extent that we're talking about it but they feel energy they they know that it's a real thing well well i think the reason why they may feel it now Mm-hmm. Because that's like it's it's a trend. Like if you really listen to a few people, they will say like, "Don't mess with my energy." You know, they would mm-hmm. different things on, and it's because it's trending. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, but the people that are like me and you that have been big on energy since for years, it's like, d- like, don't play with it because it really is something you know yeah yeah but i mean you know we can we can protect ourselves <laughs> well charles thank you so much thank you before we end i want you to talk about your podcast and where people can find you sure thing <laughs> no <laughs> so the podcast that I host with uh, Sean, it's called Views from the Two. We are available on Apple Podcasts. We are also available on Spotify, Google Play. Um, we don't have a YouTube page up yet. That is something that's in the works. Mm-hmm. Um, we are on Instagram if you wanted to follow us. It's VFT, the number two underscore podcast. Um, and you talk about everything on there. We talk about it all. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about entertainment, culture, you know, sports, life, relationships, right. you know, you name it. Um, season three is coming to a close. Episode 50 will be dropping at the end of the year. And then we will be doing episode four early 2021. And the, the episode that I was on, that was views 
Yes, that, that was, was these. Okay. That is episode 50. That is the year in review wrap up. Okay. Which and- will probably be broken in two parts. <laughs> yeah, because that was that ran long. <laughs> and you produce podcasts. So let let folks yes, know I, about that. Yes, You're a podcast that. producer. <laughs> <laughs> so, Got a network in the making. I, I do. I, I do. know. I refer to myself as the podcast tribal chief. I produce Gridiron Guys podcast, which is hosted by Russ. You're mm-hmm. now my cousin. Mm-hmm. And Sean. There's also the Royal Club Wrestling Podcast that was formerly hosted by me and Asad, but now it is hosted solely by Asad. I do sound engineering for other podcasts as well. Are you thinking about introducing any new podcasts? You don't have to tell us, but if you want to, you can. Yeah. <laughs> I am. But okay. I'm not going to say what. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you <laughs> offline. I'm and pretty I, sure you no. Know. Yeah, well, if, if for he who shall, who shall not be named, yes. we won't talk about <laughs> that one. But... <laughs> Yes, there is one that, that I would say I will say is it's been in the works for some years. I just don't know how to go about it. Like it's the biggest one for me. Mm-hmm. And that's the podcast that me and my brother have been talking about doing. Oh man, that would be beautiful. <laughs> that would be great. I see him on Instagram. Yes. I see his messages, his videos. Yeah. What's that one called? For the love of. No, for the love of. For the love of. Okay. For the love of. If you ever listen, okay, for those that listen to that, go go and subscribe to Views from the Two. If you ever listen to anyone that my brother is on, which I believe is like two or three. Mm Mm-hmm. It gets very heated because <laughs> my brother loves to debate. Right. And right. It it's just it's a never ending. <laughs> now was he were did you two do everyday brothers together or who did that? Everyday brothers was me, Sod, and Sean. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. that was that was that was the three of us. And mm-hmm. then from Everyday Brothers, Views was created. Okay. So if you were to look at the Views podcast, if you're on Apple and you look and you go through the seasons, you're going to see Everyday Brothers' name on there. Okay. Then it transitions from that to Views. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, a lot of people look at that and be like, you changed the name and you know (laughs) basically it was a transition from that you know but as i've told everybody and i said it earlier on this podcast when season four drops you're going to really tell there's a big difference you know the the creative side of what i'm trying to do the conversations it's going to be different Mm -hmm. it's going to be different from what it was we're still going to have fun but yeah keep doing what you're doing Thank you. I'm I'm doing, it. I mean, thank wow. <laughs> I'm so thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. You can listen to all of our podcasts on traditional podcast platforms. Wherever you listen, be sure to subscribe. Remember, you can send me an email and let me know what you think about our show at Let's Start Healing Podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, let's. Start healing.